So there's a federal agency that enforces Title IX. Uh, it's called the Office for Civil Rights, and it is a sub-branch of the Department of Education. And the Office for Civil Rights has the putative authority to cut off federal funding from educational institutions if they do not comply with Title IX. And they have actually used this to devastating effect during the Obama administration. So they published the Dear Colleague letter in 2011 uh, which made it significantly easier for accusers, who are overwhelmingly female, of course, almost exclusively, to bring charges against the accused, who are, again, uh, almost exclusively uh, male. next speaker appears to be a career student leeching off of the big government money in academia while doing everything he can to undermine proper scholarship, all while agitating to promote a misogynist agenda through Title IX abuse and frivolous, vexatious lawsuits. If any of you are dubious as to this character characterization of this gentleman here, one only need to look at his hair and uh, hear his name to, to realize that this person is truly a patriarchal supervillain. Uh, I give you Kursat Christoph Pekos. I mean, Blofeld. Um, welcome. Thank you. I'm imitating Jordan Peterson's hairstyle, so. So thank you, first of all, for being here and coming here and uh, just making this conference possible. And thank you also for uh, listening to my talk. Yeah. Um, I've been in academia my whole life, really. So um, I have a degree in molecular biology and genetics. And then I decided to switch to English literature, which was probably you know, not the best decision. But um, um, I did an internship in EMBL Heidelberg. That was before I quit biology. Um, I got an MA in English, and I'm currently pursuing my Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Southern California. They probably regret the fact that they offered me a letter of admission, but you know, that's their problem, not mine. So, um, and I've been doing a lot of like legal work, so in software as you can do it without having a law license, but you know, there are ways of working around that. <laughs> Um, I work as a professional translator in my spare time, so all my Title IX advocacy is pro bono. It's not really paying the bills, so um, I also have to make a living in addition to that. And um, I also do some uh, co like consultation work. Um, I worked for a law firm in Ohio, and I'm currently working for a law firm in Los Angeles. Uh, and I'm also working as an editor for Warren Farrell, uh, and I'm going to be editing uh, the next version, the upcoming version of the myth of male power, which Warren is going to rename the paradox of male power. Um, and um, I also have some prospective corporate duties showing up due to some recent developments in my family. But um, I engaged in some past civil rights advocacy, and I, I'll just like mention this very briefly within the co context of Turkish politics. Um, I've done some uh, advocacy uh, for most for religious minorities as well as ethnic minorities. Um, I visited the Armenian Genocide Memorial, for example. Um, I engaged in advocacy against electoral, fr electoral fraud. Uh, with Islamists are currently in power in Turkey. Uh, I worked as a bodyguard during the Gezi protests, which was again a civil uprising against the Islamist regime. Um, and I was also a signatory to the 2016 declaration, we will not be a party to this crime. Uh, and the Turkish government is currently cracking down on the signatories. Uh, so you can actually get arrested if you are one of the signatories. It's not always like very reliable. Some people can get into the country and leave the country without facing arrest. Others just like spend a long time in jail. So, but I don't really want to face the risks so right now. Um, I also uh, worked as a pro bono teacher for CYDD, which is actually a feminist organization. So I did that within the context of Turkish politics. And um, they actually uh, try to improve the educational opportunities of women from the underdeveloped parts of the country. And I find that consistent with my overall philosophy, so to speak, because 
just, I, I mean, obviously, I've done a lot of work to oppose gender discrimination against men. Uh, within the context of Title IX in particular, but that doesn't necessarily mean that women never face hardships or they never change, they never face challenges. Uh, so two wrongs do not really um, make a right. Um, and um, I, I see that there are some problems with like the slide positioning, but never mind. So uh, maybe I can just, um, feminist weapon. So this is what a feminist professor called Title IX, and it is indeed one of the most powerful feminist weapons that have ever been invented and implemented in this country. So Title IX is a law that states, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of, well, basically, education. So uh, it is an amendment to the Civil Rights Act, and um, it's, backed, it's backed up with threats of loss of federal funding. So there's a federal agency that enforces Title IX. Uh, it's called the Office for Civil Rights, and it is a sub-branch of the Department of Education. Hey you, yes you, watching this video. Did you miss out on going to the International Conference on Men's Issues? Or did you go and now you miss the fun times you had at this amazing event? Experience the magic of ICMI 2019 again, or for the very first time with Honey Badger Radio's ICMI Disc Set. The Disc Set brings ICMI presentations together in one convenient package, as well as Disc Set exclusive Badger bonus content. Enjoy behind the scenes Badger interviews with free speech and men's issues luminaries like Sargon, Janice Fiamengo, and Count Dankula, as well as a never before seen Badger cartoon. Also available is sparkling ICMI merch such as our professionally designed program book, sticker sets, badges, and more. Go to feedthebadger.com and claim a piece of men's rights history for yourself. And the Office for Civil Rights has the putative authority to cut off federal funding from educational institutions if they do not comply with Title IX. And they have actually used this to devastating effect during the Obama administration. So they published the Dear Colleague letter in 2011, uh, which made it significantly easier for accusers, who are overwhelmingly female, of course, almost exclusively, to bring charges against the accused, who are, again, uh, almost exclusively uh, male. Um, and this was backed up with the threat of uh, loss of federal funding. And I believe the Department of Education during the Obama administration issued at least five what they call letters of impending action, basically saying that the institution will be deprived of its federal funding unless it complied with the very specific and often unconstitutional mandates that were imposed by the Obama administration. Um, Title IX was also used in the past to abolish athletic teams for men. And I know that this has caused like significant grievance in, in kind of like in the athletic community. And that's because Title IX has been interpreted in the past uh, like what they call uh, a proportionality prong. And according to the proportionality prong, an institution has to offer uh, athletic resources to men and women proportionate to their um, relative enrollment. So, and because women are also the majority of students in colleges, this now creates a vicious circle, really, where it's becoming increasingly difficult for institutions to comply with this um, proportionality prong of Title IX when it comes to athletics. Uh, that's because, let's say, if an institution has 60% uh, female enrollment, then 60% of all the money that they spend on athletics has to basically, it has to be spent to create athletic opportunities for women. And because we all know that men are more interested in athletics than women, it's just one of those politically inconvenient facts that really creates a bizarre dilemma. And I know that most institutions are also really in a double bind about this. But um, I have done very little about Title IX athletics. That's something that I'm looking into right now. But most of my advocacy has focused on due process and especially uh, to challenge financial discrimination against men in colleges. So to just go back to Robbie Suave's coverage. Uh, some of you may recall the Avital Ronell controversy. This was a feminist professor at NYU who was accused of sexual harassment against a male graduate student. Uh, Nimrod Reitman, with whom I have been in like brief communication, and it's kind of interesting. 
Of course, victimhood is the most valuable commodity in the feminist economy. Uh, but, and you will think that just to be consistent, just for the sake of consistency, when they have one rare male student who, you know, is victimized by a feminist professor, they will like side with the male student just for the sake of consistency. But of course, they are incapable of doing that. So they actually rush to the defense of the feminist professor who was accused of sexual harassment against his male student. And the letter was originally secret. It was leaked um, by, by, by a professor who was like, didn't really like the idea, so they solicited his signature, but he decided to leak the letter anyway. Um, and I decided to just like call my presentation the deconstruction of Title IX. Um, and I won't really go into like detail, but um, deconstruction is like a philosophical tool, so to speak, which is, I, I would say it's somewhere in between criticism and destruction. And I'm just going to um, define it in terms of really trying to locate the internal tensions within a meta-narrative in order to attack the meta-narrative itself. And here the meta-narrative is, of course, feminism. And what I've been doing is trying to identify structural weaknesses within this feminist architectonics so that you know the whole structure becomes more and more unstable. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of like try to explain how I've been trying to do that. Um, so the first uh, Title IX complaint that I filed um, was 9-16-21-28, uh, and it was a Title IX complaint against the University of Southern California. Um, and I was only, um, I wasn't entirely aware at that time, but this apparently broke some internal uh, taboos within the Department of Education for two reasons. One, uh, this is the first time in history the Department of Education accepted a sexual assault complaint from a male student against a female student. And what happens there is, uh, no matter what they say about the final outcome, by allowing that, like, they create the theoretical right for men to file sexual assault complaints against women. So this federal agency basically recognized the right of men to file sexual assault complaints against women. Now, why is that significant? Title IX itself is a gender-neutral law. But the criminal definition of rape in this country, um, as you know, it relies on penetration. So gender is not spef specifically mentioned. But generally speaking, uh, a woman penetrating a man without his consent is not something that happens very often. So it's still, it's a counterintuitive definition that excludes most versions of female on male domestic or sexual violence. But the Office for Civil Rights, by accepting this complaint, basically just rendered that criminal description moot. And that's interesting because Title IX is administrative law, so it's not criminal law. Which, I guess in a certain sense, creates a duplicity between the criminal definition of rape and the administrative definition of rape. Um, and another interesting thing is like the guidance documents that are published, uh, promulgated by the Department of Education, uh, have always emphasized female victimhood. If you read the notorious, now notorious, Dear Colleague letter from 2011, it's of course about like one in four women, etc. Uh, even when the possibility of male victimization is mentioned, and it's mentioned very briefly, uh, it is made clear that the perpetrators are also male. So the whole theoretical possibility of female perpetration has been excluded from that document. So. In a certain sense, I guess like what I was trying to do is to highlight the tension between the language in these uh, internal guidance documents and the plain language of Title IX, which is gender neutral, and see what the Office for Civil Rights does to resolve this uh, inconsistency. And what they did was, I guess like at that time, they uh, accepted a complaint. Um, they accepted a sexual assault complaint specifically against a female perpetrator. So I guess they made their decision at that time, creating an administrative precedent. But more importantly, um, they also uh, accepted uh, some kind of class action allegation. And I find that to be even more significant than the first allegation in the, in the complaint. Um, and this also goes back to Yusuf versus Vassar College. So as you may know, there are a lot of male students who filed Title IX losses against their institutions. Uh, because the unfairness in these campus tribunals is very, very extreme. Many of you are, of course, familiar with the bias in family courts and bias in criminal justice system. 
but the campus tribunals are just a different world altogether. It's, it's just a different level. It's just bias taken to a different level. And most people outside of academia find it actually difficult to believe that these cases are even happening. So uh, it's, the bias is really that extreme. So understandably, we had a massive wave of lit litigation with hundreds of federal lawsuits pending right now um, against these unfair tribunals. Uh, but one of the first cases that you know found its way um, that was to a federal judge's docket was Yusuf versus Wasser College. And in that ruling, uh, the federal judge actually dismissed the male student's lawsuit by saying that if you are a male student who is trying to prove that you were a victim of discrimination, you have to prove two things. One, you have to prove that a woman who is accused of sexual harassment or assault will be treated differently from a man who is accused. So it's not just enough to plead discrimination against the accused because you know there's the hypothetical possibility that maybe an institution that is uh, biased in favor of female victims may also be biased in favor of male victims. Of course, that's not really, that's not a real life scenario, but you know, federal judges actually wrote that, so this became case law at that time. The second objection that the federal judge had to the male student's lawsuit was, you have to demonstrate a pattern of bias. So it's not enough for one male student to face injustice, it's not enough. You have to demonstrate that there's a pattern of like male students. And this standard has been relaxed since, so we had rulings from the Second Circuit, the Seventh Circuit, and the Sixth Circuit, which just relaxes pleading standards. Uh, but back in 2016, uh, basically this OCR complaint uh, established that uh, one, the Office for Civil Rights can actually accept these complaints if you make the right allegations. And then the rest of the, um, this complaint has kind of like a complicated path, but it has kind of like a complicated past. So it was originally accepted as an individual complaint, uh, and then it was upgraded into class action the next month after I uh, notified the federal government that there were male students who were beating the University of Southern California in state court at that time. Um, and then, um, all the allegations were found to be in good faith and objectively reasonable in December 2017. And then several months later, they were dismissed for insufficient evidence. And then uh, now they're on appeal. And the federal attorney who dismissed the complaint had to resign from her position after I filed a complaint against her. Her name is Laura Fire uh, with the inspector general. Um, because like, I argued that the evidence of bias was overwhelming, that the case law had changed, that she could no longer really deny that that bias is real. Um, and uh, the inspector general agreed with the complaint and um, the former regional director of the San Francisco office who had jurisdiction over 40 million people resigned from her position as a result. So that's the due process advocacy. Um, but actually most of the complaints that received press coverage recently are challenging something different. It's what I call financial discrimination. Um, and this complaint, um, well, like the complaint that I, I guess like uh, spawned, kind of like the cascade of complaints that we filed uh, after that time, uh, it was 9-18, um, it was 9-18-2031, so that was the docket number. And it was originally dismissed by the San Francisco office. Um, it was dismissed by a federal attorney who basically wrote in a dismissal letter that scholarships and affirmative action programs for the underrepresented sex do not violate Title IX. And then I argued, but how can you say that women are the underrepresented sex? Because the data is so obvious that women are now overrepresented in colleges, so how can you defend this position? And th there's of course the argument that they make that women are still underrepresented in STEM and business, but there are no affirmative action programs whatsoever for men in the disciplines wherein they are underrepresented. And overall, there are no affirmative action programs for men, even though they are the minority of students, undergraduate students, graduate students, and academic employees uh, in this country. So that argument failed, so I appealed the dismissal to the Trump appointees in the Washington headquarters. They reinstated the complaint, and uh, that's how the federal government finally recognized that men are a minority in colleges. So you would think that this would be a no-brainer, you know, but it's actually not, so it had to 
take a lot of like legal fight. And of course, they didn't want to give up the fight because uh, recognizing that men are a minority in the educational sector, uh, once you recognize that, once you enshrine it in the case law, of course, that shifts the logic of affirmative action laws. And that can lead to the potential elimination of a huge affirmative action industry. And of course, they don't want that. So, um, yeah. There are some programs uh, that we are challenging, such as women's studies and women's centers. So there's no final consensus yet. I know that there are internal disagreements within the Department of Education about whether these programs are also going to be challenged. But we did collect affidavits from uh, male students and professors who said, we want to take classes in men's studies, but we cannot do so because the university is not offering them. We also collected affidavits from scholars who said, we want to teach men's studies courses, but we cannot do so because, again, the university does not fund these programs. So um, I, I guess like I've done my best at this point to advocate on this issue. Uh, but even if women's studies and women's centers are not challenged as such, I think uh, scholarships, non-athletic scholarships for women uh, seem to be on the chopping block now. So that seems to be the current consensus. Um, anyway, um, what happened was um, after 9, 16, 20, 28 was dismissed. So that was the due process complaint. And to me, that complaint was very important because of its precedent setting value. Uh, and I didn't really like the dismissal. So I did something that I wanted to do for a long time. I went on a hunger strike. Um, and um, so I, I basically took no solid food for 32 days. Uh, but I did take liquids and vitamins. And I was under a doctor's supervision. Um, and uh, the hunger strike had two motivations as I try to convey them to the Department of Education. One, uh, I wanted the precedent that we established against female on scholarships to expand. So I was pressuring the Department of Education to launch investigations against other, ins other institutions uh, on similar grounds. And I was also really unhappy with the dismissal of 9, 16, 21, 28. Um, and the Yale complaint was accepted on day 28. 28 of the hunger strike so I sent them basically like medical tests that's like a I, I, I think that's probably not very intelligible uh, on the screen but that's like a urine analysis showing that I was you know on, on the brink of starvation at that time and I obtained this documentation because the senior editor of College Fix Greg Piper kind of questioned whether I'm really on a hunger strike and that was that was odd, but OK, I understand the skepticism. So I documented weight loss, and I also went to the doctor to run some blood tests and things like that. Um, so the Yale complaint was accepted on day 28. And Laura Fire, who uh, wrote the dismissal letter for uh, the complaint that I mentioned, had to resign from her position uh, sometime after. And uh, one unelected bureaucrat has jurisdiction over 40 million people, which I think in itself is a huge problem. Uh, but at least she is no longer working for the Department of Education. So she's somebody else's problem now. Um, and that's a picture of my fridge. Uh, again, the lights are so bright that I cannot really see much. But I'm hoping that you can see. Um, it's, it's just like a picture of my fridge with like various liquids, mostly like orange juice and Powerade and things like that and coffee. Um, one thing that I should definitely say, if you're trying to lose weight, do not fast like that. It's absolutely the worst idea. I was 180 pounds before the strike. I went down to 160, and now I'm more than 200 pounds. So don't go on a hunger strike if you're trying to lose weight. Yeah, but apparently it, it's a failure. So test it and try it. Um, and that's how the Department of Education launched an investigation against Yale. Um, I believe there was one former investigation. I mean, the Ivy League has been investigation uh, many times for discrimination against women. Uh, the Department of Education actually allowed going after high-profile institutions during the Obama administration. Uh, I'm unaware of any previous examples of Ivy League schools being under investigation for discrimination before. 
And there was significant press coverage because most people, of course, did not know the backstory. The hunger strike itself was not publicized, so it was just the Yale complaint that was publicized at that time. Um, and up until that point, I actually kept my identity anonymous because I'm in academia and doing all this pro-male advocacy is really academic suicide. And I, part of me knew that by going public with the Yale complaint, I was really uh, just destroying any chances of obtaining an English professorship like anywhere, I think, in the US. But, you know, I, I don't really want to teach English anyway, so that's what I'm telling myself. <laughs> Uh, there, there was a lot of like press coverage from Campus Reform, College Fix, PJ Media, Wall Street Journal, Fox News, Inside Higher Education, Washington Times, NBC, USA Today, etc. Some of it was positive, some of it was negative. It's kind of interesting. I think this particular issue uh, was very much covered along partisan lines uh, because I was opposing affirmative action for women. I know that there are some men's rights issues which are bipartisan or it, they can even be refused from like both sides, if that makes sense. So I know that men's right activism does not always neatly fall into the conservative versus progressive spectrum, but in this particular complaint, because I was challenging affirmative action, which is kind of like a Republican cause they celebrate, uh, there was a lot of positive press from the, uh, con from basically like conservative journals and outlets, and there was a lot of negative reaction from progressive outlets and much of the negative reaction focused on me being like an angry white male and like things like that. Uh, so you can kind of see that there were seven programs uh, that were accepted for investigation and the Department of Education is still being very stringent. Like even if the program had some kind of vague language saying, um, like implying in the lease that men could apply to these programs, they still refuse to launch an investigation against that program, and which is kind of really disingenuous. They're, they are called like women's X, women Y, women Z, and institutions do not offer any affirmative action programs for men, etc. So you would think that it will be again a no-brainer, but it's, that's not really the case. Um, and there were also some allegations about lack of standing or uh, redressability and um, well some people basically complain that I as a USC student should not be filing complaints against Yale and other institutions but the thing is again it's a question of double standards because there were feminist activists who during the Obama administration filed thousands of duplicative complaints against many different institutions and all those complaints were accepted and investigated and nobody complained at that time but when a male student does the same, even if it's just three or four institutions, you suddenly become a serial complainer. So um, that was an interesting uh, situation as well. And I, I did collect some affidavits. So even though these are female-only programs, and even though it's obvious that men would not ordinarily apply to these programs, you, you sometimes get men who do complain about these programs. So it's not always that clear cut. So to the right, is an affidavit that I collected from a former employee at Yale uh, who tried to register his son to a girls on the camp and of course it did not work. Uh, he himself complained about the female on the conference uh, that did not work either and uh, Yale actually retaliated by putting a mark on his HR record so and he eventually like left his position at Yale. And the other one is a one page excerpt from a lawsuit against Yale by an accused male student who was also complaining about how Yale offers women's studies and women's centers with nothing equivalent for men. So, and these are just some of the messages that I received, like uh, poor angry white men, uh, would it be too much if I suggest I cut off their dicks and deny them sex entirely, like things like that. So there was a lot of like hate males, I guess like we get them all. So there's nothing significant about that. I guess like one thing that I found disturbing was I was compared to mass shooters several times. I was called a white male terrorist by one journalist. Um, and that was kind of like strange. There were some Twitter messages, again, along those lines. I guess filing a civil rights complaint against an institution is like blowing up that institution. I, I don't quite understand. But um, <laughs> there, there, was, there was a lot of angry reactions online. Um, 
uh, we also filed like two complaints against Northeastern and Georgetown. So these were filed under NCFM's letterhead. I wrote complaints for basically whoever wants to challenge these programs. So not just for NCFM, but also for different organizations as well. Uh, the Georgetown and Northeastern complaints were filed against, like they were filed after two professors affiliated with each institution, uh, you know, became public, became just kind of like national news uh, with the statements that they made. So with the Northeastern, some of you may remember the controversy of the um, a feminist professor called Suzanne Danuta Walters who wrote an article saying, why cannot we hate all men? This was, you know, uh, published on the Washington Post. And the Georgetown complaint was inspired by Christine Fair, uh, who said, well, why cannot we just castrate and kill white male senators and feed their corpses to pigs? So um, there's that. And, um, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> So the complaints are actually, again, challenging all this female on the program, so it's not really, uh, and the statements made by these feminist professors is just a re really minor aspect of the complaint. Uh, but, you know, um, and in a sense, I think the public perceive that if a professor can say such an outrageous thing, maybe there's something wrong. So I think that generated positive publicity, in a sense, for the complaints. Um, and what I did was, I argued that uh, the article, the Washington Post article, did not violate Title IX because I understand that it's p really unpleasant, it's perpetrating misandry, but there was nothing that was specifically calling for violence. And compared to the other statement, it was pretty mild. I mean, it was kind of like a pseudo intellectual article. So, and we don't want to punish people for writing, you know, pseudo intellectual articles. Um, but the other one is just indefensible or at least so I thought, but an attorney who is working for FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, and the attorney's name is Ed, Adam Steinbow, actually disagreed with me and uh, told to the press that uh, Christine Fair saying that white men should be, white male senators should be castrated and killed does not violate Title IX. So, I mean, you can imagine the, of course, the outrage that will happen, the multi-million lawsuits that will be filed if that was changed with, you know, uh, it, like if, if a male professor made a similar statement about women. So I find that position very disingenuous. I understand that there should be First Amendment protections for everyone, and we don't want to penalize people for their speech. But at the same time, if you just flip the script, then the reaction is going to be very, very different. So I disagree with FIRE. And of course, I don't know what the final outcome is going to be, but I think my position was the more reasonable one. Um, and while we were just kind of like preoccupied with all these things, we actually managed to obtain a positive ruling against Tulane. So when the Department of Education launches an investigation, that's sometimes a good indicator that there will be a favorable resolution, but not always, so it's not actually guaranteed. But with the Tulane investigation, we went all the way, so there was a final resolution letter. And um, Tulane, again, listed a lot of programs, a lot of affirmative action programs, scholarships for women only, even though men are only 39% of all students at Tulane, which makes no sense, of course. But, um, and Tulane resisted this, but I think they received a threat of uh, loss of federal funding, probably like the first time in history. So they were probably quite shocked, but you know, that did happen. And as a result of this resolution letter, Tulane agreed to um, but basically make available to both sexes some resources that they were stashing for women only prior to that resolution letter, including the Nivcom College Institute itself, which has an endowment of $38 million. Um, so I would like to thank to Margaret Volua, who is the attorney I collaborated with uh, for the Tulane complaint. Um, I see that there's more funky script here. Uh, after the Tulane complaint, we filed a coalition complaint against Cornell um, and I basically just, you know, try to collect as many signatures as possible. It is similar in nature and legal theory to the Tulane complaint and everything else. Um, and I collected 193 signatures. That was the final tally. And there are 
authors, think tank presidents, lawyers, professors, and activists who signed the coalition complaint, including people who are here. So thank you for your signatures if you did sign the Cornell complaint. Borden Farrell, Christoph Summers, Larry Alexander, Peter Wood, Mark Hathaway, Andrew Miltenberg, these are specialist Title IX lawyers who have previously pled cases in front of appellate courts before. Mark Angelucci, uh, Janice Fiamango, Jordan Peterson, Cassie Jay, and many others. So thank you, thank you all for your signatures. And the story was covered by Glenn Reynolds for USA Today. And it has been the top result in Google's algorithm for if you type in male Title IX or men Title IX, uh, it's the first link that you will get. Uh, from among 50 to 80 million results. And it has been the case since November 2018. So I don't know who did the algorithmic work to make that happen. I have no idea, but I would like to thank those individuals as well, because I know that Google's algorithm is very biased against men's rights. So whoever pulled that off must, like, must have done a fantastic job. And of course, like, I would like to thank Glenn Reynolds for publishing that article as well. Uh, these are just like two pages. It's the first page. Actually, the first sentence was contributed by, by Christina Hoff Summers. And then there's a huge addendum listing everything. Uh, the page doesn't even end here. So Cornell had at least 33 programs for women only. And that's just what I could find. They may have more programs that are not listed publicly. So, um, And I'll just give you like a very basic feel of the scope of financial discrimination that we are trying to challenge. And these are just like some numbers. With most of the programs, I actually have no idea, but their endowment is because it's not publicly listed. But at USC, we have the VICE program, Women in Science and Engineering, which is an endowment of 20 million. The Bertie Corbett Fellowship, which is for women in business, is $70 million. Uh, Yale has one program among many that distributes half a million dollars per year. So the endowment will be somewhere between 15 to $25 million. Tulane University agreed to um, abolish Nivcom College Institute, which had an endowment of 38 million. At Stanford, we found that the average male MBA student has to pay $7,000 more every year to Stanford uh, and with 419 students, that's like close to like $3 million every year. Um, they have a Women's Leadership Innovation Lab that has an endowment of $15 million. Cornell, the President's Council of Cornell Women has an endowment of $297 million. Brown University has a action, diversity action plan uh, with an endowment of $165 million. Um, so the nationwide there's no nationwide estimate, but it's at least $1 billion. I, and I think this is just the complaints that I myself wrote. Like, there may, be, there may be more out there. So it just shows how pervasive this problem is. And this estimate does not even include women's centers and women's studies. Uh, and if it is possible to challenge them, and again, it, that's not really up to me. I've really done my best. Uh, but if it is possible to establish men's centers and men's studies on college campuses, I think the the amount that we are challenging will just go like as soon, there will be, you know, um, it will be just way higher. So the one billion estimate is just for scholarships and affirmative action programs. Um, let me see how much time we have. I'll just very briefly touch the Harvard APA issue. Okay, yeah, five minutes is good. Um, so the Harvard APA complaint I have to just acknowledge in advance that this was a more tentative and experimental comp complaint than some of the others. Um, but I did my best. And you know, here's the thing. If APA is obviously endorsing these discriminatory guidelines, uh, because APA's guidelines for women are very, very different from the guidelines for men, and if Harvard is endorsing this obviously discriminatory policy, then I don't really see how uh, Harvard is not in violation of Title IX, and there was quite a bit of legal theory uh, that went to the, into this complaint as well. So, um, unfortunately, the complaint was dismissed by the Boston Regional Office. This is, a, again, a regional office of the Office for Civil Rights. And I, I filed FOIA requests in the past with the Department of Education to track their historical progress. Uh, there were, like, two FOIA requests in particular. Um, which tracked nationwide data. 
So that's hundreds of resolution letter. It's not fun to you know like read all of that and like try to do data analysis. But the Boston Regional Office has never favorably resolved a Title IX complaint filed by a man before throughout its entire existence. So obviously they dismissed the complaint. Uh, I decided not to appeal due to several reasons, although I filed a different complaint challenging the APA guidelines with a different institution, and we are currently waiting for the results. It may end up getting dismissed. I think um, the case for challenging the APA guidelines through Title IX, I think it is consistent with a plain reading of the Title IX statute, but it's still more tentative than uh, challenging these female on the programs and scholarships. So I don't really know where that will go. Jordan Peterson uh, expressed dismay. We had some uh, internal discussions like CC lists where we discussed these issues. So uh, other people have also expressed dismay, but again, it's not really up to me to make the final decision. Um, I also had some problems with my English department, such as a feminist professor trying to sabotage my dissertation. And they took away my stipend, uh, my annual stipend, and uh, they put me on a probationary contract once. So they're basically doing whatever they can without running afoul of the anti-retaliation laws because Title IX complaints are also protected by uh, anti-retaliation rules. Um, they're just basically torturing me as much as they can. And you know, well, there, there's very little that I can do, but I haven't been expelled so far, which is probably just my greatest accomplishment so far. Um, and that's it. So after I was deprived of my annual stipend, I decided to run a GoFundMe campaign. So it's not pleasant begging for money, but you know, uh, they took away my stipend, so there's nothing I can do about it. So thank you so much for listening to my uh, talk, and um, I'm ready for questions. I just want to say this is evidence that most of the real work done is not glamorous, it's not done on YouTube. It's done by somebody who just will not give up, so. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's also kind of boring work. Like you have to read thousands of like resolution letters and it is, it is quite boring, but yes. Okay, so I understand you're trying to get American academic institutions to treat men more fairly. You, you talk about financial yeah. discrimination. How important is it um, to have people who can, can share a, a, an anecdote, a story, an affidavit from the institution in order to make a, a change versus filing complaints as an external person? How, how big of an impact does it make to have those people who you can find at those institutions well, that say, yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yep. So internal, internal persons or people who are affiliated with that institution usually do not want to file complaints against their own institution, even if they are sympathetic to the idea. So I've co communicated with several people in Harvard who were sympathetic, but there's this idea of like institutional loyalty, so they don't want to go after their own institution, even if they do sympathize with the complaint. So in a sense, it's actually quite difficult to find people who are willing to testify against their own institution, but we did find some people because it's, you know, um, so they can't really say that, you know, we have never found such individuals. So that we did collect affidavits in that, uh, in that vein as well. Um, the New York office dismissed a complaint against Princeton by saying that I was unable to find affidavits in each and every female on the program that they list. They said, you have to find an affidavit from a male student or professor who specifically challenged this program and who specifically received a rejection before we accept your complaint. <clears throat> but then I think the New York office was marginalized. There are now different regional offices that have been launching similar investigations. So now they look like idiots. So, uh, and I think ultimately that rule is going to be waived because we already have the Tulane precedent. We did not find a single affiant mm. from Tulane. So I did collect statements from Cornell. Um, I, I believe there were like nine affidavits at least um, when I was done, in addition to the signatures, and mm. these are individuals affiliated with Cornell. Uh, so I know that they cannot say that about the Cornell complaint, but okay. yeah. I, I imagine there's some use of networks to try to find people even if, can it be done that anonymously? That would be great, yeah, that would be great. If there's anyone who wants to challenge discrimination like this, they uh. can always reach out to me. Uh, but ultimately, 
I mean, these are female only programs, like no man is going to want to join women's faculty forum. It's, it's just not going to happen. That, that's, it's irrational and unreasonable to request that, but yeah. But the ones who do, because they do, that actually is a good opportunity to, to show better, if they were rejected. Yes. yes, it's better if we can find a okay. fines, definitely, yeah. Because it, it, it just makes it more difficult for them to dismiss the complaint. You spoke about, um, <clears throat> now this is looking ahead, uh, if there is some success that uh, colleges and universities might have to start funding male studies programs and that sort of thing. And I'm wondering if you have any, any thoughts, uh, specifically if they don't change the people who are running things at the colleges and universities, they'll just create programs with those names that push out the same propaganda that yes, the women's I, studies. I, so uh, do you have any thoughts on how to prevent that? It, it's something that we did discuss. I'm fully aware of that potential problem, but I think it's better if institutions have the legal obligation to create men's studies and men's departments. I think it is better than not having that legal obligation. And what I'm assuming that if there's such a legal stipulation and there will be a large market, and then people with competing worldviews will be able to, you know, I guess like sell their ideas in that market, that's what I'm hoping for. But yes, it is entirely possible that a, an ultra-liberal institution can just create a men's studies department and just fill it with people who teach, you know, toxic masculinity and all of that. Um, but I think at least like some people will, will be able to, you know, infiltrate, I guess like academia, you know. Um, hopefully it would have like at least some positive effect. We can hope. Yes, we'll see. It's, it's too early to discuss that, but we'll see. Thank you so much. Ending on hope, that's a good, good thing. Um, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, everybody. And um, we will adjourn for um, 12 minutes or so. And then I believe it is, I believe, but don't quote me on it, I will be introducing Sonia Schmidt uh, for the next talk. So um, hopefully we've got all our crossed wires resolved and, uh, and we'll be good. Um, so go, uh, take a break, take a breather, um, and as I'm going to do, smoke them if you've got them. <laughs>